I don't know whether many of you saw in the, I think it was in both the Mail and the Telegraph. I think it was in both the Mail and the Telegraph a few days ago, or a week or so ago, um, a report that the European Union had asked the government to change the passports to remove reference to the Queen. Did you all see that? Yeah. And it actually had details of what the old passport said and details of what the new one was going to say. And I thought this was just about the last straw. Now, we happen to live in a house that fronts on to Broad Street in Oxford. And uh, over the last few years, our front windows have become well known in the, in the, in the town as being a, a place which people who feel you are skeptic can come and read the latest news. Yeah. And in fact, uh, I put up on that day a cutting out of the newspaper showing these two separate passports in juxtaposition and along with this note. Now, most of you won't be able to read it from that distance, but it says, how much longer are all you spineless sheep going to put up with this? Your country is being dismantled before your very eyes and you do precisely nothing. Will you finally resist when they come to tattoo their numbers on your arm? I doubt it. Goodbye, England. The present generation didn't deserve you. I say that because I think we've really now got to go to shock, shock tactics. We've got to actually shock people into realizing that we're probably living in the last days of democracy in this country unless we do something about it. Yes. And it's only going to come down to a, f a, f a few people, a few hundred people, that are going to actually make the difference between whether we carry on as a democratic nation or whether we enter a new dark age. Most of you here today are going to be amongst those few, but it's up to us to actually go out and try and put this message across. Yeah. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure now to uh, welcome here Christopher Gill, who uh, many of you will know uh, is in fact uh, a member of the NEC of UKIP, as of the last few months, I think, mm -hmm. two months ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a, a very distinguished backbench Tory MP for many years and uh, was well known as one of the true Maastricht rebels. So yeah. he has uh, an impeccable history of being both prescient and taking positive action to protect our country. I give you Christopher Gill. Thank you, Chairman, very much indeed for that very flattering introduction. And ladies and gentlemen, whilst I'm speaking about the Chairman, I wonder whether you would put your hands together in a show of appreciation for David Samuel for having organized this meeting today. David, we'd like to thank you and your happy band of helpers, uh, not least, of course, your wife Susie, for having made all this possible here today. Thank you. The second thing I want to say is, can you all hear at the back if I speak like this? Yes. Yes. Very good. And the third thing I want to say before I launch into what I had prepared to say was that there were so many interesting things said during the course of our conference today that I'm almost tempted to take issue with uh, not just one but several of the things that were said. But I'm going to be impeccably behaved and stick to the script that the, uh, not the script, the, the title that the, the chairman has given me. Now, often in the past, I've begun my remarks with a funny story. But I'm not going to do that today. I haven't done it for some time, ladies and gentlemen. Do you know why? It is because we are no longer facing a very funny situation. Mm, yeah. We are facing a situation which is desperately serious. And if it turns me to any sort of emotion, it is an emotion of sheer anger at what is happening to our democracy and our country today. And as well as being angry, ladies and gentlemen, for the reasons that uh, uh, Guy Herbert and others have referred to, I am not a little fearful. 
for my liberty and the liberty of all of us in this country today. Now, as far as the European Union is concerned, I won't like it if the people vote to continue our membership of the European Union. But if that is what they want to do, as a Democrat, I'll accept it. But my proviso is this, and it's a very important proviso. I want to be sure that the people of this country have been given the facts. Yeah. If given the facts, they... If, given the facts, they decide that this is something they want to do, then, as a Democrat, I have to accept that. I should be very disappointed. I will think they are wrong, but as long as they've been given the access to, to the facts of the situation, I will have to accept it. But the truth is, ladies and gentlemen, we have been lied to. And what's more, the deceit, the duplicity, the obfuscation and the downright dishonesty continues to this day. In a government-wide paper published in 1971, it said, oh, the, the white paper was entitled The UK and the European Communities, and in there it said, there is no question of any erosion of essential national sovereignty. That's what they said. And previously, on the 25th of February 1970, Prime Minister Ted Heath had said, there will not be a blueprint for a federal Europe. 21 years later on BBC Question Time, the same said Ted Heath, said the sing was asked a question, and the question was, the single currency, a United States of Europe, was that in your mind when you took Britain in? To which Heath replied, of course, yes. <laughs> John Major told us that joining the single currency was essential for British jobs and national prosperity and propelled us into joining the exchange rate mechanism, the precursor of the euro, with absolutely disastrous results, record numbers of bankruptcies, massive numbers of repossessions, and practically doubled numbers of unemployed, up from 1.67 in October 1990 to 2.85 million less than two years later. On Black Wednesday, the 16th of September 1992, the day on which Britain unceremoniously abandoned its membership of the ERM, the Conservative Party's reputation for economic competence was utterly destroyed. And 15 years later, it has yet to recover. But undeterred by this ignominious defeat, or by the fact that the Danish people, in the meantime, had rejected the Maastricht Treaty in a national referendum, Major proceeded to ram the treaty through the House of Commons, saying, just as Gordon Brown is now saying, that Britain's vital interests had been secured. <laughs> Enter, pants on fire, Anthony Charles Linton, biggest liar of them all. Under his premiership, we were promised two referendums, one on the question of joining the single currency, and as of April 2004, another on acceptance of the proposed EU constitution. Ladies and gentlemen, as things stand, neither of those promises will be honoured, and there are absolutely no prizes for guessing why they won't be honoured. But that is the background against which we've witnessed the hollowing out of our democratic institutions, and the imposition of a plethora of legislation alien to the British way of life. It is a background of breathtaking deception, despicable double dealing, and shameless dishonesty. Yeah. Now, as you'll see from your programs, I've been asked to speak about the powers that Parliament has given away, and a depressingly long list it is too. At the very top of my list is the abject surrender of the sovereign right of the British people to be governed by laws made in their own parliament by representatives that they themselves elect yeah. and who they themselves may just as easily get rid of at an ensuing election. Yeah, yeah. Se second on my list of surrender pa surrendered powers is that of the House of Lords as the highest court in the land, which has now, as we all know, been superseded by the European Court. Thirdly, under the terms of the Maastricht Treaty, Her Majesty the Queen was declared to be a subject, a, I beg your pardon, a citizen of the European Union. 
an ignominy which must surely rankle with our head of state, who at our coronation on the 2nd of June 1953, as David Abbott has already reminded us, had promised faithfully to govern the people of Great Britain and Northern Ireland according to their respective laws and customs. Historically, under the British Constitution, which I admit is a bit of a patchwork, including Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, Act of Succession, the Parliament Act, a virtuous circle had been created by which those elected by the people, in other words, the members of Parliament, swear an oath of allegiance to the monarch, who in turn, under the terms of the coronation oath, makes that solemn pledge to govern the people according to their respective laws and customs. Now, for as long as that happy state of affairs lasted, there was accountability. And more to the point, there was the means by which the proverbial man in the street could obtain redress, either in the case of a legal dispute by appealing to the highest court of the land, or in the case of political disagreement by booting the rascals out at the next election. That virtuous circle, I'm sad to say, no longer exists. Too many of our parliamentarians regard their oath of allegiance to the Queen merely as an irksome, non-binding formality. And the Queen herself, by dint of our accession to the Treaty of Rome 35 years ago, has been placed in the unenviable position of having seen her promise to her subjects effectively rendered null and void. This, ladies and gentlemen, without a shadow of doubt, is the single most significant power that our Parliament has given away the right of the British people to be governed by those that they can hold to account and whom they can, in the final analysis, get rid of. Do I hear someone say, hang on a minute, even now Parliament could, if it had the will, repeal the Treaty of Accession? And of course, you would be right. A fact confirmed by a government minister in reply to a recent parliamentary question. Sadly, that situation is about to be overturned under the terms of the EU ever so slightly amended constitution to be put before the Intergovernmental Conference in Lisbon next month, national parliaments will henceforth be treaty bound to further the interests of the EU itself. And in those circumstances, it doesn't take much imagination to forecast what the European Court of Justice would conclude if at any time post-Lisbon, Britain or any other member state said that they wanted out. What is being played out now really is the end game. The result of that game, if the integrationists succeed in their nefarious purposes, will be that national parliaments will have no more power left to them than the average county council, an outcome famously envisaged and welcomed, I might add, by a former Tory chancellor, the member of parliament for Rushcliffe. As I said at the outset of this list of powers that our Parliament has already given away, it, the list is awesome, but let me just mention spef specifically just a few. Our trade policy. Incredible, though it may sound, the trade policy of the country with the fifth largest economy in the world is no longer dictated by the Secretary of State in London, but by the EU Trade Commissioner acting on behalf of 27 EU member states as a whole. Now, I have to be very careful how I say this next word or two. Our sole European Commissioner... <laughs> I obviously wasn't careful enough. Our sole European Commissioner, and bear in mind we used to have two, the twice discredited Peter Mandelson now struts the world stage dictating or de deciding what our trade policy will be as, of course, a compromise with the other 26 member states. How absolutely appalling that we, as I say, the fifth largest economy in the world, have lost total control of our trade policy. Look at fisheries, the common fisheries policy, and I won't go into any detail on this because I'm sure most of you know all about the common fisheries policy. What a disaster that when we joined the European Union, we gave every single other member of the European Union, whether it was six states or 10 states or now 27 states, 
equal access to the common resource. In other words, they all, whether they had a fishing fleet or not, now have access to our waters where more than 60% of the fish stocks of the European Union lie. The common agricultural policy has been ruinous. And what a peep peep cheek that we now have to endure the ignominy of officials coming over from the rest of Europe to see whether our foot and mouth procedures are in order. But beat this, in a parliamentary uh, answer, very recently, uh, the Minister of State at the Department of um, Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, to give its polite name, um, in answer to a question about the commercial growing of gen genetically modified potatoes, said this, the European Union has agreed that licensing decisions on the commercial use of genetically modified organisms, oh, I better be careful again, aren't I? O organisms, including GM potatoes, should be taken, and watch this word, should be taken collectively at EU level and in respect of the EU territory as a whole. And ladies and gentlemen, if you want one key word to what is going on in our world today, it is that word collective. We are living in a collective. We are living in a world in which the European Union wants to collectivize everything. It does not want us as a country or even us as individuals making our own decisions. These must be collective decisions. And, of course, the, uh, the political provenance of that will not have missed many of you, not escaped many of you. Uh, fourthly, I wanted to mention frontiers. I think this subject has been uh, adequately covered earlier in the day. Uh, the cardinal principle of the EU, of course, is free movement of goods, services, capital, and people. And uh, in, in that respect, I would just make this simple point uh, that... Nobody forced our company, our, our country, uh, or our parliament to sign up to the Convention on Refugees way back in 1951 when I concede the world was a very, very different place. Nor did, it, um, nor did anybody force our government to sign up to the Charter of Human Rights, nor indeed any of the treaties on European Union, nor more recently the Human Rights Act. These are all things that our parliamentarians have done uh, in our, in our name, but they never asked me, and they never asked you, and they never do intend on so many of these crucial issues to ask us, and that is why we have to go on making a noise and making a nuisance of ourselves until, as David says, uh, we, we finally get through. The fifth aspect of all this that I just wanted to mention, and it isn't a power that this has actually gone completely yet, but it is being eroded all the time. And I'm talking now about the law. Be in no doubt whatsoever that the European Commission and indeed all the other institutions and member states of the European Union will not rest until they have imposed corpus juris upon us in place of the British common law. And of course it is the British common law which has for centuries ensured that we can truly call ourselves a free people. It is our British law, with its law of habeas corpus, trial by jury, presumption of innocence, and all the other protections that makes us free, and it's our British law that keeps us free for as long as it survives. In spite of what the government tell us, there is no equivalence between the continental system of criminal justice and the British system of criminal justice. In a word, the British system protects the individual against coercion by the state, whereas the continental system, based upon the Code Napoleon, is specifically designed to ensure the supremacy of the state. Yeah, yeah. In the Anglo-Saxon world, the prosecution must prove guilt. On the continent, the defendant must prove innocence. And I don't know whether there are any people here who've ever had to prove a negative but take my word for it, proving a negative is extremely difficult indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, when all is said and done, it was in defense of liberty that we def defended ourselves against the Spanish Armada.
that we raised armies to fight and defeat the continental tyrants, Napoleon Bonaparte and Adolf Hitler, that we armed ourselves against and faced down the threat from Soviet Russia, and why we must, in this new century, free ourselves from the totalitarian embrace of the European Union. I now turn to the question of how members of Parliament can resist giving away more powers to the benighted U European Union. By the simple expedient of voting to repeal Section 2 of the Treaty of Accession, Parliament could, if it so wished, release us from the Brussels straitjacket altogether. Yeah. With one bound, we could be free. But that isn't going to happen. For that to happen, one needs a majority in the House of Commons, and at the present time, the number of members of Parliament who would support such a motion can be counted on the fingers of two hands. Sad, isn't it? The alternative, and don't hold your breath over this one either, the alternative is for the Conservative Party to have a Damascan conversion, <laughs> whereby its purblind commitment to remaining within the corrupt and sclerotic EU is transmogrified into a realisation that EU membership is the very antithesis of freedom and democracy. But that isn't going to happen either. Notwithstanding that, in my opinion, such a common sense move would propel them to the top of the leaderboard and give them the chance of winning the next general election, which they most certainly don't have at the present time. So, what are we left with? What stands between us and the prospect of our members of parliament giving away more of that which in all honesty is not theirs to give away anyway? Answer, only the heavily discounted prospect of a referendum. And I know there are many different views about referendum, but I'll give you mine. Earlier I said that Blair's promise of a referendum on the EU constitution, just like his promise on the, of a referendum on the single currency, would not be honoured. That I believe to be true. On the other hand, I do not rule out the possibility of a referendum altogether. Indeed, as time goes by and the pressure mounts, I believe that Gordon Brown will be forced to give us one. But make no mistake about it, if he does, it will be strictly on his own terms. But if you were Gordon Brown, a political operator of no mean ability, I might add. And if you want to know more about him, learn more about him, do read the biography that was recently published called Gordon Brown by somebody called Sower, I think, S-O-W-E-R, very illuminating. Anyway, if you are this, um, uh, th th this uh, political operator, first of all, you get your left-wing friends on the BBC Newsnight programme to interview David Cameron for an hour. <laughs> and and when, you've, when, you've, when you've quizzed him on every subject under the sun, and at the end of the program you just pop in a question, Mr Cameron, what is your view on the European Union? And Mr Cameron replies, I believe that we should remain in the European <laughs> Union. Mr Cameron's in the box that Mr Brown wants it be in. And so what happens next? Mr. Brown has a further word with his friends at the Beeb, and he says, how about doing an interview uh, with my oliginan, oh, oh, how do you say this word, oily, this oily stooge who sits on my back benches by the name of Keith Fares. Oliaginous. Oliaginous. And the BBC obliged. And so we have Keith Thaz appearing the night after Mr Cameron saying we must have a referendum, but the question must be in or out. So that's two lemons up. Better have a word with the Ming dynasty now. See if we can um, get him on terms. 
and Ming cooperates, because the Liberals always do cooperate if it's in a direction of total European integration. And so the Liberal Party now is committed to a referendum on an in or out subject, in which Mr Cameron, if he's true to what he said on Newsnight three weeks ago, is bound to campaign for a yes vote, to stay in the European Union. So clever old Mr Brown, he's got, us all, he's got them all uh, boxed in. But in or out is the question we want to see fought. We have the better argument when it comes to in or out. It'll be a harder, a harder vote to win than if the vote was on the Constitution, but we have better argument on the in or out argument than we do on the Constitution. And of course, if we fought a, con a, a referendum on the Constitution, even if we won, <laughs> We know that that would not be the end of the matter because it would co keep coming back again and again until we gave the right answer or they got all that they wanted by, by the back door. So let us, let us take courage and face up to the fact that most likely, I believe it is most likely, we're going to have a referendum and it's going to be on an in or out question and that is the referendum that we want to win and my goodness me, we must win. Finally, Chairman, with your indulgence, um, but I must get to the end of my assignment, um, let us see if we can identify the path to a recovery of self-government. Believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, between 1921 and the handing over of Hong Kong to China in 1997, Britain ceded self-government and independence to no less than 60 separate territories around the world. For whatever reason, our Parliament took the view that the days of empire were over and that the expedient and or enlightened thing to do was to grant to all our dominions and virtually all our colonies home rule. What an astonishing irony that even before this process had been completed, our leaders were already negotiating to give away our own self-government. Exactly. It beggars belief that a nation which twice in the last century has been embroiled in life and death struggles in the defense of freedom, should in the latter half of that same century even contemplate giving away the sovereignty which its peoples had expended so much in blood and treasure to preserve. So who were these people who believed that our nation's future was with the European Union? They were, just as they are today, the very people we elected to represent us in the Westminster Parliament. Why and how have they got away with it? Well, in a word, ladies and gentlemen, and I speak advisedly, because the pressure from the party whips has up until this present time always been very much stronger than the pressure that the members of Parliament have experienced from their constituents. And so, we as constituents, in our various constituencies, have got to start giving these people hell. Yes. We've got to, we've got to realise um, that the kid gloves have now got to come off. What is going to change uh, the situation, or what's going to persuade our parliamentarians to change their tune? And I think the answer to that is only the realization that if they stubbornly and stupidly refuse to heed our views, there is going to be trouble. Now, tempted as I am, I'm not going to go so far as to say that the European project is going to lead to civil commotion or insurrection, but given the existence of the European Gendarmerie Force, which can only be for one purpose, mm -hmm. that of ensuring that the writ of the uh, European Union runs throughout the member states by force if necessary, I do not rule out the possibility of civil unrest in the longer term. <coughs> but now, in the here and now, we the people have to make it abundantly clear that we will not vote for European integrationists of whatever hue and that we will spare no effort in seeing them and the parties they represent defeated at the polls. 
Some of you in this room may, for one reason or another, want to vote for one or other of the three main political parties, either because you've always done so or because you feel that they're the lesser of the three evils. But the point is, ladies and gentlemen, I think anyone who's followed the debate today must realize that it makes no difference which one you vote for, you get the European Union in spades. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so don't, don't let's be sentimental about this or li livid about it. The cause we are fighting for is without exaggeration our very freedom and our democracy a cause for which millions of our predecessors fought and died. Our parliamentarians know the score, and if they don't, they should be ashamed of themselves. Generally speaking, these people fall into three categories in my book. Those who believe that we would be better off out of the Euro European Union altogether and have gone on record publicly saying so. Those who take the opposite view and who actively support the surrender of our self-government, and those who in private share our views, but nevertheless choose to toe the party line. In this scenario, the saints are the patriots who boldly state their opposition to European integration, and the sinners are the traitors who promote it, and the fellow travellers, the quislings, who pathetically but knowingly collaborate with them. To my former colleagues in the House of Commons, I would say this. The time for dissembling and prevarication is past. Either you are for or against self-government. And just as you must now make your choice, so too will we, the people of this country, make ours. And let me, in conclusion, also say, not as a threat, but as a promise, that our politicians need to understand that whatever it takes, and however long it takes to achieve it, the people will win. And so we will. last. I think we've got time for just a couple of questions. Uh, gentlemen there. Thank you. Um, Chris, bearing in mind, as you've made very clear, if a random, if referendum is granted to us, it will almost certainly be manipulated and used by the executive to justify its own will yeah. in some way or another. How is it going to be that gaining a referendum, which I believe we should be fighting for, because it's the only way of expressing our very great anger, how is it that gaining a referendum will actually gain us any position? Well, I, I hear what you say, and you're absolutely right. Governments never, ever fight referendum campaigns unless there's a reasonable degree, a reasonable chance that they're going to win. And, of course, the government will always frame the question. I'm much more confident that we can pressurise government into having a sensible question if it's in or out than if we were having to vote on the constitution where the question would be long and convoluted, half the people wouldn't understand it and the government would get the answer uh, that it wants. Incidentally, I think Gordon Brown believes that he too will do better on an in or out question, so don't despair that it won't be a simple question. Well, I, I think that it, it sends a, an absolutely unequivocal message to all our members of Parliament, um, whether they agree with us or not, that the will of the people is out and that they better get busy and make sure that that um, accession treaty is, is repealed. Will they listen, though? Well, so who said if they if they listen if they, Will they listen? if they listen? Well, it's it's a very valid question because they don't appear to be listening at the present time, and they don't appear to have listened for a very long time. But if they want to avoid civil unrest, that's what they'll have to do. Gentleman in the top row, in the top tier, with glasses, hand up. Yes, you next, sir. You, yes. <laughs> don't look around. Thank you, uh, Marcus Watney. At uh, times of elections, I spend quite a lot of time in schools, particularly supporting mock elections. 
I'd like your advice. What do you think, because the most important people who we haven't talked about today are the young people. What do you feel is the best approach to, uh, to bring young people in on our side and show them what the, their future may be? Th thank you for that question. I, I do quite a lot of talks to schools, and uh, the audience here would be interested to know that when I go into the school and take a show of hands, most people, most of the pupils are in favour of staying in the European Union. Almost invariably, after I finish with them, there's only one person in the room who wants to stay in the European Union, and that's the teacher. teacher. <laughs> but it, but it, we have to, we have to address uh, the young people in the terms that A, they understand, and B, the things they're interested in. And I talk to them about their future. Do they want a future where they have no say in what goes on in their country? And there is another theme we sometimes use about the disastrous effect that the common agricultural policy is having upon the third world. And I tell them that the amount of cost to the third world, to the pastoral economies in the third world, exceeds by a factor of 14 the amount of aid that we give to the third world in cash. Isn't that amazing? And the young people their eyes open and, 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 and they're interested. I, I could go on, but you need, really need my whole script. I hope I've helped. Lady there and then gentleman in the centre. Could you tell me how we're going to persuade our young people to come on board when the EU are sending out diaries to all That's our right. young children in schools? This is something which, of course, concerns us very much indeed. Our money is being used to peddle a load of propaganda, uh, one-sided, entirely one-sided, as indeed we've seen over the uh, climate change debate. You know, the Al Gore's uh, video was pumped around all the secondary schools, and uh, as yet there's been no answer to that, or the, the alternative hasn't been made available to the, to the schools. I haven't seen that particular uh, document. If afterwards I could have a quick sight of it, I'd be very... Very grateful. But it, the, the, we all ought to be in uproar again with our members of parliament, with our head teachers at the schools, and saying, Why are you allowing this one sided presentation of a case? I think Helen wants to say something on that. <coughs> you can challenge that in court. That's a yeah. Well, then maybe we should do that. Yeah. Let's try and do that. that. Yes. yes. Um, and there is actually a teacher's handbook. I mean, what is with it? Yeah. The thing is, that is one-sided political propaganda, uh, which is actually illegal. Um, you'll have to go back to a particular bit of legislation. Can you give, can you give us help on, on finding out what the exactly Well, I can do. look it up. I can look it up, yeah. But it's, it's definitely illegal, that. It can be challenged. There is actually a lot, there is a lorry driver who is actually taking legal action against the uh, Secretary of State for Education for having put the Al Gore uh, video around schools and um, it sounds to me as though a similar operation ought to be mounted in respect of, of that booklet. James Fenton. Uh, James Fenton, you kicked off with, sorry. Um, I absolutely don't know where you're um, absolutely, absolutely brilliant speech, um, Christopher, if I may say so. Very stirring and a brilliant end to this, uh, this day. Um, my only point, I think, is that you, you, you concluded by saying that uh, we have to get the people of the country to act and that in the end we would win through. Um, I see the apathy and complacency which exists in this country because, as with Europe and America, we are all relatively comfortable and, and well off and can't be bothered, too many other things to do. I see the apathy of the people stirring them into action as the biggest possible obstacle. Well, um, it, it would be easy, I think, to sort of talk ourselves into a council of despair. Uh, but I accept that on occasions like this, the audiences are going to be like this. Um, most of us seen a few summers. Um, <laughs> not too many young people. But I, I have great faith in, in, in the young. I know we read some terrible stories about some of them, but a lot of very fine young people. And they won't come to these meetings. We might be lucky to persuade them to read a, a, a pamphlet. But I think that they can be persuaded to turn out and put their cross in a box on a ballot paper 
And, and that, of course, is what we, we must do. You are, you are the ambassadors, uh, and we are the people who have to keep proselytizing and making uh, the importance of them casting their vote, expressing their opinion on this issue, even though they may not understand all the issues or um, want to understand all, all, all the issues. But don't despair. Don't despair. I'm sorry, it's not the, not the young people that I was referring to, but at the contemporaries of everyone in this room. The population at large are apathetic and can't be bothered. Politics is a great bore. Yeah, that's true. My, my personal belief, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to interest um, the, the, the party in, in general on, uh, to, to follow this, uh, my personal belief is that the greatest source of support for the UK Independence Party, which is the only party that is telling the truth about Europe, is amongst the 17 million people who at the last election didn't cast a vote. 8 million voted Conservative, 9 million voted Labour, 17 million didn't vote at all. Why didn't they vote? Well, we'll all have our different opinions, but my opinion is because they're totally disillusioned uh, with politics and politicians, uh, and they have disengaged. Now, if we could get back just half of that 17 million, who, as I say, are disengaged from the political process altogether, we would have as many votes as the Labour Party or the Conservative Party. I tell you what, that would put the cat amongst the pigeons. <laughs> gentlemen there at the rear, and then followed by the gentlemen on the aisle. Mm. Thank you. I'm all in favour of putting MPs on the rack, because I think they've been, frankly, traitors over the last 30 years and giving away the sovereignty that was not theirs to give. Uh, and I, I realise that the better off campaign is, is one lever that can be used to determine whether or not an MP is sympathetic to exiting the EU or it will show clearly their Eurosceptic credentials. But the question I'm asking is where does the, what used to be the South Malta Declaration and the, now I think it's called the British Declaration of Independence, where does that stand as a possible additional lever to force the MPs uh, to bring back our sovereignty that they've given us away? Well, I don't know the answer to that. Um, Rodney Atkinson would be the man to tell you how many members of Parliament he's got to sign up to his declaration. But I tell you this, nothing makes a greater impression on a member of Parliament than you, preferably with two or three of your pals, going along to his surgery on a Friday night or a Saturday morning and making an infernal nuisance of yourselves and not taking a no for an answer and being there again next Saturday and the Saturday after until the man gets the message. Now, I speak, say, uh, advisedly because I've, I've been there and I cast my mind back and I say to myself, well, what actually caused you to think very hard about certain issues? What perhaps caused me to change my mind about certain issues? And it was the persistence of some of my uh, constituents who just didn't give up. They kept on and on and on about the same issues and they wouldn't let it go. That was very persuasive. Letters have some effect if they're personalized, but uh, the, the sort of round robin letter, I'm afraid, doesn't get us very far. Uh, Helen Samueli was saying, look at what happened to the, the marches in London and uh, the demonst demonstrations and the petitions. Government aren't sort of minded to take much notice of those. But as individuals, we can't take the government. On. How, do you, how do you address the government? How do you sit the government down in front of you and shout at them? You can't do it. All you can do is sit down in front of your own member of parliament and give him a very hard time. He works for you. He's there to represent your views. Gentleman there. Mr. Chairman, my wife usually has the final word, but perhaps this is my chance. May I, may I ask Mr. Gill never to think of retiring? Britain needs you. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm very touched, as indeed I was by the, the standing ovation. You're all very kind, and um, I, I must say, I've met a better class of person than you, Kip. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
ladies and gentlemen, I think we've heard a tremendous speech here this afternoon from Christopher. And uh, my goodness, it's good to see him now as a member of UKIP yeah. and also as uh, on the leading council, the NEC. And uh, I'm sure that he will, be, uh, will add an enormous amount of weight, gravitas and reason to everything that UKIP does over the next few years. And uh, I'm sure that we are all looking forward to working very closely with you, Christopher. We're most appreciative that you've given up your Saturday to come down here from Shropshire. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that in, its, in itself is, is quite above and beyond the call of duty. We do appreciate it. You have given us an enormous amount of heart by your hard-hitting speech. And we, my goodness, are going to fight back. It only remains for me now to close this conference. I'm not going to uh, spend any time on summing up because we are now past four o'clock. We've caught up on some of the time, but we are due to be out of this uh, hall uh, immediately. Uh, otherwise, uh, I incur another hour's fee. <laughs> I really do want to avoid if I can. I just simply would like to thank all of our speakers. Mark Wallace, who had to go at lunchtime, um, Michael Shrimpton, who it's marvellous that you've been able to stay all day, Michael. Thank you very much indeed. Guy <laughs> um, Herbert, who has also come and, and spent the, the afternoon. <laughs> and Helen Zanuelli, who walked here from Winchester Station. <laughs> And of course, to Christopher Gill, our star performer. There are very many other people I'd like to thank very quickly, and that includes uh, my team, Colin Mason, John Clark, Lawrence Hole, Ray Finch, Hedley Lester, and several other people that I've left out, but not last but not least, uh, my daughter, Louisa, and my wife, Susie. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.